Okay, there we go. Okay, Emma. Hey all, very, very welcome. Um, thank you all for turning up this evening, for taking this time, this hour, hour and 15 minutes to, to, yeah, to learn more about this grief ritual that we are hoping to host here at Mount of Oaks in May. So you know the date and this is your chance to hear more from um, Kedar and about the ritual itself. Um, I suppose from our point of view, we are really, really excited um, for this to go ahead. The conduit of getting Kedar to us has been Hayo. And those of you who don't know already know Hayo, um, maybe he'll say a little bit about himself. But um, yeah, most of you already know us and know this place and know that Barbara's been here since 2006, holding and stewarding this land with the intention of those who come experiencing themselves in nature. And um, all sorts of people have done all sorts of processes over the years here. So it just feels very, very fitting to have Kedar come. And um, I think that's a little bit, so it's me. And then Barbara's not gonna like this, but no. Barbara's here. Hello everyone. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's present and she's offering presents, but that's it, I think that's where gone. Okay, so. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Right. Um, very warm welcome from me. Um, it's quite exciting to see uh, all of you. And um, yeah, it's always a little bit of a surprise who will turn up. And yeah, um, I think we, we have a really good opportunity to uh, learn um, about the grief ritual, about the backgrounds, about uh, maybe a little a prequel about how, yeah, this whole idea started. And um, since probably Kader and me are the only ones who took part in something like this, um, I can share a bit of my experience and Kader is gonna talk about it in more depth and um, yeah so for me it's been a journey to um, going back to 2016 when I met good friends of Kedar on Iona in, um, on the Scottish coast and uh, they were really uh, very enthusiastically telling me about uh, the grief ritual and I got so excited that I really felt like a, like an urge or like a calling to to experience that myself and um i went to to northern england uh yeah um into in 2017 and uh that's where i met Kader. and uh during the whole attending the meeting and going through the rituals um I don't have a big background story with uh, shamanic practices or um, nature-based healing. And um, I myself, I'm a psychotherapist, so I'm of course in the healing business, so to say, but in a more um, conservative or in a more wet, most mostly Western, yeah, established style. And I work in a clinic and, uh, I was really touched by the um, deep connection with the place. Um, and I think the, the pla place, it has a very important role. And um, since I know Barbara and Emma for many, many years, and um, since I also experienced um, the Mount of Oaks as a place of healing and a place of rest for me personally in different points of my life, I immediately thought like, okay, this is something that could work very well um, in Portugal. And so I think the year after um, I went uh, to visit and I introduced the idea and um, yeah, here we are now. We tried to pull, pull it off uh, last year, but didn't have enough attendees or enough people to, to get it started. But there was no doubt that we're gonna try to do this again. And um, hopefully in May, I will see 
most of you and even more people at Mount of Oaks. I'm really excited and um, yeah, I'm looking forward. About uh, the topic of grief, um, I, I always feel like, okay, is this something you really can invite people to? Because it's, it sounds very, um, yeah, very serious, very sad, or maybe very painful. And my experience was um, that there was so much joy and so much uh, inner release in going through the process and in the community and in experiencing and being in touch with um, so many amazing people uh, that I was so so blessed to have this experience and um, yeah as you maybe have heard uh, it did uh, impact me quite a lot and um, so yeah I'm really looking forward to to do this again and to join together with you and go through this process yeah I think Kader will talk about it more in depth about what's really happening like the choreography of the ritual and there will also be a time um, yeah maybe the last 20 minutes or so for you to uh, ask any kind of questions you have any thoughts you have or if you want to share something, something that speaks to your heart or something that is, yeah, just coming up, um, please feel free. And uh, you can also use the, the group chat box below and write some messages. We'll be checking this parallel to, to the webinar. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, and I, I'm glad to, to welcome Kader and um, yeah, thank turn you. over to him. And thank you, uh, Emma and Barbara, for your willingness to host this event. I um, want to begin uh, with some other gratitude in a, in a ritual form of just acknowledging the ancestors from which this ritual descends. So from the Dabara tribe of West Africa, to Melodama's grandfather, and from Melodama to me, and from me to you. The structure and the choreography of this ancient and powerful ritual. So with much gratitude to all those ones that carry these ancient rituals and ceremonies across their lives and generations and pass them down to us in this day and this time. Ashe. Ashe. You know, something Hayo just said reminded me of that, that phrase, and I'm sure it's been said before, but this idea that our capacity to feel joy is proportional to our capacity to feel grief. And so this idea of a uh, why would people come to a grief ritual? And, and yet when I think about the grief ritual times or like when Hayo was referencing it, it's like, I can't think of many more times in my life where I have laughed so much. And it's always a, an interesting paradox that we go into this experience for, for grief and we encounter this immense joy and laughter uh, as, as we come out of it. Um, so they, these, these two, uh, this brother and sister walk hand in hand, this grief and joy. And that's why often uh, grief and praise, as we would say, Martin Prechtel would have spoke about, or grief and gratitude, uh, that there's this fine edge uh, between these, this, these two brothers and sisters, as I might call them, that um, where we can tip just one side or the other um, into the grief. And then there's that place where, uh, where they become the same thing where the grief we feel uh, bubbles up from some place of blessing, some place of joy, um, some place of gratitude, and it's so immense that we just feel grief. Um, so the, the ritual itself was um, passed along to me um, originally through uh, an apprenticeship with Melodoma, Back, it started back in 2003, Meldoma Somme. 
And uh, he's from the uh, Burkina Faso and the um, Dogger tribe of West Africa. And then going with him to Africa in 2009, um, and it just happened to be that when we were there with him, there was a grief ritual happening that we got invited to. Um, and so we went, we got to enter into this uh, sacred container with this community uh, that lasted three days in which there's this great big shrine and the, the body of the person who is deceased sits in the shrine um, literally. And it, it's very similar across the planet where there are often three days in my personal ancestry in, the, in, the, in Ireland, the, the, the common ritual of laying the body out for three days or being with the body for three days is a common practice across many ancient cultures. And this way of preparing and assisting uh, the dead to make that, that journey home. Um, but grief, I wanna talk about grief as something that's larger than that. Um, not simply an ancestral grief ritual that, well, if I'm not aware of somebody that has died, then that's not something I'm dealing with. Um, think of grief as not as uh, in our Western society here, uh, grief often gets identified as a personal dilemma. And what I encourage you to think about is grief as a collective responsibility, not a personal dilemma, but a, but a community and a collective responsibility of offering. Um, that in many indigenous cultures, grief was considered um, food for the spirits. It, it, was, it was acknowledged as an offering, a necessary offering. Um, not something that simply gets in the way of, of uh, being productive. Um, and so uh, in grief rituals, like the kind that would come together in the village for several days, is, is really to purge and welcome any grief about anything um, in one's life where we just, we, we tend to carry and absorb these things not only from our own life, but across generations. We'll talk about ancestral grief in a little bit. Um, so there's grief that we carry uh, in the feeling of compassion and empathy for another, uh, or the planet, or the environment. Um, as uh, in our country, Joanna Macy is known as uh, probably the grandmother of eco-philosophy and activism and, uh, and she says, when I look around the world, and she's been active in, in uh, shifting uh, consciousness around the planet, uh, and she, I think she's in her 90s now, um, she said, I used to think that it was ignorance and greed that got us in this position that we're in globally. And she said, I don't think that anymore. What I think is that is the inability to feel grief and the unwillingness to feel grief. Uh, because once we start shutting down that, we lose that ability to be compassionate, to extend our compassion, to feel deeply empathetic to what's happening around us. Um, and so opening up grief is not only to open up joy, but to open up compassion and connection with others, um, human others and non-human others. Um, and so when, when I heard that, I thought, you know, as, as I have a, like Hayo, I have a clinical background in, in psychotherapy. Um, it's like, well, that makes perfect sense. That once you start shutting that part down, um, then it's, uh, it's challenging to feel deeply about much of anything. Um, and then what happens is we become a society that's dependent on stimulation in order to feel something. So we need more and more stimulation and we need it faster and faster so that we can feel alive. So in the absence of uh, feeling difficult emotions, we manufacture experiences of feeling alive through uh, being stimulated through something in the outside world. Um, so the ritual itself came from that experience and, and being in the village where there was, as I say, the shrine and the, the, the family members of the, of the deceased person walked around, they had blue beads on, and each one was shadowed by someone that walked with them everywhere they went. 
um, and there was drumming and there was singing and there was feasting and this would go on and on and on. And, and uh, similar to, uh, for anyone who's in the field of psychotherapy, you think of a, a psychodrama that a person could run, literally run up to the shrine and the, the gatekeepers, I would call them, uh, could hold the person at the shrine and they could reach and, and express and say and release anything that was up for them. Um, so in that experience, Meladoma himself created a westernized version of that and, and taught us the, the grief ritual process. Um, so that's the origins um, of, of the particular choreography of the grief ritual. Although this idea of grief rituals, uh, again, are, are consistent and they're pan-cultural. They exist across cultures, across history with our ancient ancestors. Um, and again, from my own Irish Celtic ancestry, uh, you, you know, they, they would call uh, the, often women would be called into, um, to do keening. Keening is a, a kind of wailing. Um, so I call them tear listeners. So uh, tear, uh, when I say tear listeners would come into the home and these people are particularly attuned to listening for grief. And as they so listen to the situation, what's happening, they would begin to keen or to begin this, this uh, wailing. And that would loosen the grief that was present in the field uh, of people. And then they would begin to join and this was all seen as a necessary uh, avenue to help the, our, our loved ones transition from here to the realm of the ancestors. Um, and so as they, as I've heard it understand in, in, uh, in Africa, you know, if, if when, when someone, uh, when a life ends, they, they have to cross a great river in order to get to the realm of the ancestors. And it is our tears that create the river. And if we don't provide the river for them to cross, then they might not get across. And then what happens on this side is people start getting pulled in, die in accidents and tragedies and unresolved grief, starts getting pulled into that river. Um, and so the necessity of grief as an offering, a community offering, is, is, a, is a, a framework or a construct to begin to think about what is a grief ritual? Um, so I've talked about grief as one's personal grief, and it could be the, the loss, the death of one, another that they loved. It could be uh, the end of a relationship. It could be um, the loss of a job. It could be getting older and looking back at one's life saying, you know, I'm having to grieve uh, the loss of my younger years and the reality of now I'm getting older and I'm no longer able to do these things I used to do and, and, and having that, acknowledging that grief. Um, so I call this our, our personal biographical or uh, grief, that, that which is part of our story um, that we carry. Um, and then there's the grief that's carried outside of us that we feel, the empathetic resonance that we feel with the environment, with friends, with another, um, where we just feel the grief that's in, what I say, in the field. It, it's, in, it's around us. And we, certain people are em empathetically attuned to feeling that. Um, if you think of grief as they do in... Um, well, think about it this way. So, so in a lot of indigenous cultures, they don't have the same use of verbs and nouns that we have. We have way more many use of nouns, than, at least in the English language. They would use verbs. Things would be alive. Things would be expressed as, as alive and moving. So that um, this idea of to be, you know, like you can't be depressed. You can't be this. You can't be angry. You can't be uh, we'll just take depression, so we're talking about grief. Um, you can't be that thing, but that thing as a, as a third thing can come into your life, it can get in your spirit, it can get in between you and someone you care about. 
And so it's spoken of, well, well, grief has come into the field. Grief has gotten between us, just like anger can get between us, not something somebody is. Um, so in the same way that our language informs our perception, um, in indigenous cultures, their use of language used verbs a lot more. So things were again alive and, and, and moving. And, and so we are always held in relationship with them. And that's, and that's how grief is. It's a, a living energy. And, and when it's in the field, it starts looking for a way out. And if the person who experienced the, 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 uh, some of the origins of, of the grief doesn't allow it out, it will simply start looking for another avenue to come out. And, and those of you in, in family systems therapy and all of that, you'll see the ones that finds a way out is often the adolescents or the children because they just kind of release it. Um, and I'll tell you a, uh, a couple of stories. Um, well, one story um, was of a, a story of an abuse situation that happened many uh, years ago. And these two, uh, two ladies were friends. And, and one lady had learned to heal the abuse by talking about it and dealing with it. And the other never did. And there was a sense of, of uh, the one who had, who had done the healing work really wanted the other to, to bring this story and they never could bring it. Um, and what happened is that that other person's story um, turned into a song and that song made its way out through this other person who then began to perform the song. And then the healing began to trace back to the original source. So when we think about grief, uh, grief like most emotions are simply an energy looking for a form of release and healing. Um, and then another situation years ago is uh, working at a, a wilderness recovery center with um, teenagers. And I had this, uh, um, it was a rehab center and they usually brought to us for about eight weeks. And I had this young man that, that his parents brought into the, the wilderness recovery center. And I hadn't yet met the young man, but I'm sitting with the parents. And um, the parents are telling me that, you know, our, our son was doing great in school. He had made good grades. He was on the soccer team. Um, he was socially active. Um, and after his birthday, he started gradually getting more and more depressed. And then he started using drugs and now we're here. And so as I'm listening to this, uh, I get suspicious of this, this depression, this grief just seemed to show up. Uh, they said, we're not aware of any trauma, anything that happened. We just don't know what's going on here. And, um, and so in, in the way that I attune myself to looking for different things, I attune myself to, to looking into each of these person's ancestral lineages as I'm sitting in the room and beside them, the woman, she's sitting in front of me talking to me and the man's kind of over here. Um, I can see an old man standing beside her. It just kind of comes into my, uh, we can think of as my imaginary mind, but I see the image of an old man standing there. And as the dad's talking, I'm looking at him and beside him on his left side, I see another old man. And so I get curious, um, and so I start asking mom about, um, you know, this feeling your son has, this grief. Tell me about your family. Um, so she starts telling me about her, her family, and I ask her about, well, tell me about your dad and your granddad. She said, well, my, my dad committed suicide when I was around 19 years old. I said, oh, okay. And we talked about that. And then I started talking to the father. And the father got around to me, tell me about his dad and his granddad. Said, my, well, my dad, my granddad committed suicide when my dad was around 17. Oh. So what we're dealing with here is this ancestral grief that's still looking for a way out. Because when the parents named it, both their heads dropped. And I thought, oh, there's a lot of grief here in the room that has not been acknowledged, that's not been released. And now this boy turns 17 and it's landed on his shoulders. It's in his spirit now. Um, 
And so helping that young man became about acknowledging this unresolved ancestral grief that had been uh, in Buddhist traditions or in some other traditions, they would call a hungry ghost. It's kind of moves through the, moves through the family system until it finds an outlet, um, a host that will, will bring it forward. Um, and so that's what we call ancestral grief. Um, and that can come through those kind of traumas. It could come through um, cultural traumas, like, uh, you know, what happened in the Native Americans or to, uh, you know, in, in ancient Britain to the Scots or the Irish when they would run off their lands or they're forced to leave. You know, I always think about, again, my ancestors from Scotland, when two th I mean, from Ireland, when two thirds of the country essentially left. Um, and the amount of grief that was felt in, in that shift and how that moves, you know, it's, it's people laugh when they associate in, in this country, when there's an association between the Irish and alcohol and, and alcohol, what we call alcoholism is drowning in grief, drowning in the liquid. Um, and so this displacement that can be generational, um, so there's those patterns of grief that aren't personal to our experience, um, but yet move through us. Um, and uh, so our personal grief, collective grief that I've talked about, grief that's ancestral that moves through, um, and then the grief that, that comes as a blessing. Um, I, I have experienced the, the passing of both my mother and father uh, my father back in 1992 and my mother last year in March and got to be with them both when they, when they died, right? They were both with hospice and I got to be very, very present with them right up until the last breath. Um, and every now and then, not even every now and then, whenever I talk about them to another or share about them, I can fear a tear from this come into my eyes. Um, and, and I've had somebody ask me one time, does, does the grief ever go away? And what my response is, I hope not. Because when, when the grief shows up, it, I know I'm connected. I can feel it in my heart and I feel this connection to, to the ones I love. And, and so there's a way that uh, grief or water is a conduit of connection, compassion. Um, without it, you know, we, we, we end up defending ourselves behind certain beliefs and certain attitudes that separate us. And nothing brings people together that I've seen uh, of, of different belief systems and, and what do we call it, political viewpoints, but you come together in a grief ritual and all of that disappears. All of those differences, all of those separations, and simply the, the common humanity uh, of, of supporting and holding for each other in that kind of ritual space is powerful. Um, so I just wanna paint a, a bigger picture of this, this understanding of grief. And um, so I said, well, you know, I'm not real feeling any grief in my life, but I'm really curious about this experience. Would this be appropriate for me? I said, well, don't worry. There'll be plenty of grief there and you can help move it. <laughs> And, and they'll think, what do you mean? It's like, well, after they go through it, they say, oh, I realize now it's like, I wasn't feeling it before, but when we entered the ritual and we started this song and people were moving and, and this was happening, he said, it just started coming through me. Um, and as I say, to think about grief as something that's looking for an outlet, um, a channel. Um, there's so much repression of uh, of that kind of heartful, vulnerable experience that there, there's plenty of it around. Um, and there's grief in the landscape. There's grief, uh, to me, when people talk about where the, 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 the trees or the forest are grieving, right? they're not grieving. What they're doing is holding our grief that we don't express. And so they're like a mother, they're holding this energy. So the energy of unexpressed emotion gets projected outward. I, I, I speak on this both from a, a psychological perspective 
an energetic perspective, and a shamanic perspective, is that when you repress an emotion within you, what happens is energetically it gets pushed outside of you. Um, and so that's why when you, when you come into contact with another who has really repressed something, you might start feeling what they feel. Um, one of the greatest teachings I got from, from uh, my Native American teacher here in, in the mountains of North Carolina, um, and this was early in my, I had to do a lot of unpsychologizing of reality because I was a trained psychotherapist. And, and so I had a good, uh, I had a sense of how to psychologize everything. And um, so I'm speaking with my, my, uh, my mentor and my teacher and he said, uh, I was sharing some, some feeling about something. And he looked at me and said, are those your feelings? And I thought, well, that, what kind of question is that? Are those my feelings? If I'm feeling something, aren't they my feelings? I didn't say that, but I figured if he's asking me the question, maybe there was a, there's probably an answer that maybe they're not. And uh, so this was, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. And, and I said, well, I don't know. I hadn't really thought about it. He said, well, think about it. And so I, I did. I said, you know, I don't think they are my feelings, but I'm feeling them. And he said, don't think that everything you feel or think is your own. Um, I mean, we are closely connected to people or to, to environment or even to animals. Um, we, will, we will feel what they feel. And it may not be our own. But again, the feeling itself is an energy. It's just finding, it's finding an expression. It's what I think animals do for us, our domestic animals that we bring into our home. Um, I think more than the fact that we're caring for them, they're really caring for us. Um, that uh, a, a few years ago, uh, my partner and I, had, our uh, dog was dying, and, um, and and we got to be with with the dog right right as he was passing, and we took the dog to the local animal hospital, and and they had this beautiful uh, mural up on the wall, and it was all these these domestic animals sitting around the table talking about which human was their assignment. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. I thought we were taking care of them. It's like, no, they, they were assigned to us because animals will absorb uh, what happens. I've seen animals take on things and even die uh, taking a hit for somebody in the family energetically. Um, so this idea of uh, that emotions are energy. I mean, it's, it's, common physics understanding these days. Um, so, so to understand grief as a collective field of, uh, of information and emotion um, that, that is just waiting for to be released. Um, and then on the other side of that is a lot of joy and laughter. Again, I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody go from, from deep, grief expression to just spontaneous uh, belly laughter and, and, and not even know, they didn't know what they were grieving about, not even know why they're laughing. <laughs> it just kind of happened. Um, so grief is, again, a collective field of, uh, of uh, emotion and energy that in grief rituals uh, were, were used to, 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 as an offering. Um, and often we think of grief rituals as, as being associated with death, um, which, which hopefully they are, um, but it's much bigger than that. Um, and I noticed that in Africa, that the grief ritual itself uh, was an opportunity for everyone to bring any grief they had about anything um, and, and just open their heart to it and, and be supported. Um, so those are those are some thoughts on grief, just as a larger field of, of um, a, a construct of information that's bigger than just a personal dilemma. As is often we 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 feel grief and we want to kind of pull in and and um, and sometimes hide out with it, or something that's uh, grief is is often inconvenient to the demands of a life that we've been living. Um, with our work schedules or our commitments or things that are happening. And so we, we proportion our grief into uh, a compartmentalized experience. 
Um, and yet imagining having three full days and nights or four full days and nights for nothing else in community to just honor. Um, because when we, when we grieve something, it says that we loved it, you know, and that's the other thing. Um, that it's a, the true, a, a true expression of, of honoring and deep love is, is uh, when, when to lose something that I loved, there's gonna be grief um, because it's proportional to the love as well. Um, and not something to be, to be squelched or managed or compartmentalized because it'll, it'll come out somewhere else um, or we'll find ourselves uh, creating a life of, of different uh, ways to manage it and, and control it um, and keep it repressed um, through obsessions, addictions, compulsions. Um, and even then it may, it may prevent it from coming out in me, but it's gonna come out somewhere else. Uh, like that song or like through that, that teenage boy that was uh, all of a sudden feeling his, his generational grief and loss for, these, uh, for his grandfather and great grandfather. Um, and I said, I think I spoke some about grief that's in the landscape that we can feel um, uh, grief in the land um, that has been unacknowledged, unexpressed, um, left there, old stories of tragedy or um, and, and to tap into that and move that. Um, so I want to pause for a minute. <clears throat> um, maybe Emma, you can, I can't see a clock or anything. <clears throat> How are we doing on time? I don't, you have your, your, uh, you're muted there. Your mic is off. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so we've got about half an hour left, Kedar. Okay. So, yeah. Um, but it might be, this might be a good opportunity for folks if they have any, if anyone has any questions um, or any responses even to what, what, yeah. what you've what, shared. What's stirring, what's stirring in, in all of you with what yeah. I've said, a question, a statement. Um, yeah, I just want to check in, with, check in with all of you. So when you speak, just unmute your mic um, and... Uh, let me know what's stirring for you. Yes, Natalie. Well, greetings, everyone. I'm here in uh, Manchester, UK. And, what? Uh, I'm here in Manchester, mm -hmm. United Kingdom. Uh, what stirred for me was the land grief. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned about the Scots and the Irish and the South uh, Indians. It's also the Mahafa mm -hmm. or the Mangamese mm -hmm. that was centuries. And, bill and millions mm -hmm. of people that were uh, robbed and taken over to um, the Americas and the Caribbean. So I've got a calling to return to Jamaica. I'm a mm -hmm. trainer and self-esteem expert. And there's mm -hmm. something about the stagnant grief in that land. Yes. Um, and I, also, I didn't really want to go to Portugal because of the uh, horrors that that king in Napoleon or whatever his name was, um, exercised in Angola with Queen and Zinga, and yet somebody said go into Portugal to do a grief um, mm -hmm. ritual will actually contribute to healing the land mm -hmm. and forgiveness. I'm part of an organization called Mortal Life, and one of the advanced courses we spend about two hours wailing, mm -hmm. absolutely uh, giving birth to grief. and and then in the program, it's not touched on at all. And um, I remember saying last time that in the African Caribbean community, if I have a birthday next week and tell people, maybe a couple of hundred will come. I die next week, four or five hundred will, will just <laughs> show up. So I, I never understand that, why uh, grief seems to be more important than life. And yet I'm noticing my culture and I, and I, and I, uh, I am at fault with that. Is that addictions, repressions, um, mm -hmm. compulsions, like you said, Kadar, 
is what we're doing and, and how grief can get its day and get its way because time doesn't heal it. Right. I've got thousands of years of grief in me. So right. I'm looking forward. Initially, I look reluctantly to come to Portugal and also see how I can support with increasing the numbers. I've got a friend coming with me, so I'm mm -hmm. already two. But I really want to see whether we can each bring one so that this is a uh, viable viable so part of me wants to know is is there opportunity for the whaling um over the course of the days yes i'll get i'll, I'll get to the choreography of the ritual itself in the second part of this um natalie mentioned something important this ancestral grief that gets stored in the land um and you're saying you know especially like going to portugal where the, all this stuff has happened um it's, it's something when I get called to a certain place to do ritual, uh, the first question I ask is what there in the land is sending out the call and what kind of ritual is, is it asking for? Um, so that the first grief ritual that happened that I ended up doing in the UK uh, was in the borders between Scotland and England. And, and those of you in the UK know that that, that territory of the borders um, is that ground is soaked with, with, you know, hundreds, thousands of years of blood um, and turmoil. And yet the, um, I think I've done three in that area so far over the years. Um, and so that similarly, it's like, well, that made sense. Why this ritual wants to happen there on that land in that place. Um, and that's important. It's, and for, for, um, for people as attuned to you, I, I would um, venture to call you a tear listener um, because you are attuned to grief that has uh, embedded itself in places. And uh, uh, that what you are aware of, uh, think of your eyes and, and your ears being the sensory system of the ancestors and what you see and hear is your job description. <laughs> So when you see these things, it means you must carry an antidote of healing for it, of bringing the people together or, or going and doing ceremony um, because you do see it. And so, and, and aligning self with this, um, the movement from there to, to Jamaica and the grief that's laid along those lines. Um, mm -hmm. It's like in this country, the, they have what they call the trail, trail of tears. Um, the Cherokee, this forced march of, of death um, for the natives, the Cherokee. And, and the Trail of Tears, literally, if we think this is a trail of grief that's embedded in the land in, in, these, in this area. Um, so yeah, the land will, will hold and take on um, that which needs to be held. It's like any, any parent would do for a child. Uh, well, let me help you hold this. Um, but it's the ancestral grief. Um, it's like once you open the, the door to that, um, then that just starts to move through. Um, there's, an old, um, there's an old Irish or Celtic proverb that um, a, similar, a similar understanding across all indigenous citizens I ever knew of, but the proverb, is, it goes like this, that the, the sorrows in this world can only be mended from the other world. And the sorrows that are over there in the other world can only be mended from this world. And so there's immediately, there's this understanding of a reciprocal relationship between ourselves and the unwell dead or the dead that are not at rest um, that if we don't attend to that unresolved grief that's lingering there, their unresolved grief becomes our unresolved grief. And so in, if we think about what, the, what it's saying is that there's this whole area between the unwell dead and the unwell living that just perpetuates this unresolved grief. And so in doing uh, ancestral healing work, um, I say that, you know, we're we're actually calling on, uh, in, in my lineage of ancestors, we might say the bright and shiny ones, those that are well in spirit, those ancestors that lived well and died well, 
uh, we're asking for their help to help heal the grief and the turmoil that lives between where they are and where I am. This, this whole repository of un, unresolve um, that's in the land, that, that settles in our spirit and each other. Um, again, it's, it's, uh, your comments just stimulate a lot of thoughts about that. Um, thank you, Natalie. Other thoughts, questions? Everybody's on, uh, Mike is on mute. So. About hi or Emma, do you have any, do you have any ones that you think of historically questions that have come up that have people asked before that you can? Um, historically questions, well, <laughs> um, maybe, um, um, yeah, I can make a link between what uh, I experienced in, um, in the meantime, since I, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, since, since I attended the grief ritual, there's been a lot of, um, yeah, uh, inquiries I made in uh, my family history. Some things I've been aware of before, but uh, not so much in detail. And so uh, sometimes, uh, um, when I'm at family visits, things just come up even without me asking them. And I feel like it's so important to, to bring this together to make the connections and to connect the separate dots uh, because, yeah, I'm the youngest one on my uh, generation in the family. And I often have the feeling of, okay, I, I'm carrying so much stuff that is not that has actually nothing to do with me, but I uh, maybe I was the, the weakest link back then. And um, so, I, yeah, in my teen years, I was quite sad for, for a long time. And um, uh, just last time I, I met my mom and she was uh, showing me a little book from my grandfather, who I never met, and he... Um, yeah, he was um, yeah part of Nazi Germany, and he was a an, an, um, yeah uh, he died during the war. But uh, he's been always so much glorified because uh, he was uh, obviously talented and gifted and very um, a musician, and maybe not so much involved in combat, but still there's. So much of this dark stuff and energy that is somehow still there and i felt like this was covered up so for such a long time and um yeah uh this last year was really important for me uh, i shared it with some of you already uh, because uh last september actually the exact date when we planned the first ritual at mount of oaks uh, I reached the age um, where my grandfather died, the exact same on the very day. So this was really a, such a weird coincidence. And I thought, okay, this it's quite impossible to, to plan something like this. But it was so important to be in touch with you, Emma, Barbara, and Kater during those days. And I even found a, um, in, um, in Berlin, close to my area, a um, guy from Israel who was pulling off a grief ritual on that um, on that day, so so much things came together and it felt like okay, I'm in this process and I I not really in control but I I go with the flow and I just respond to what is happening around me and mm -hmm. it helps me so much to um, to release all this stuff and to um, yeah start stepping in more and more in my own life and to um, follow my calling, follow my my ideals. And um, this has been really an important part of, of the last few months or, yeah. So this this is something um, 
I'm reminded of right now listening to what you said and what Natalie said and um, yeah so maybe that's one bit of uh, my personal experience that has been stirred through this whole complex of grief work yeah there's Emma, uh, can I uh, sorry <laughs> Najiza, would you like to say yeah. something? Yeah, yeah, ask a question because mm. as I listen to Kedar, Natalie, and Hajo, I have this idea, I have this voice, yeah, but they know who were their grandfather and what happened with the, their grandmother. What about who doesn't know anything from its father and its mother? Uh, uh, behind. I don't know anything about my grandparents and about my family. So are you able... I can see the ritual by it's the value by being at service. It doesn't need to be your grief, but right. I also have mine. <laughs> there is, we have plenty of our own. And we don't have to necessarily go looking for somebody else's. Um, so yeah, in, in the way of, well, not knowing that that sense of disconnection to one's lineage is a form of grief in and of itself. Um, there's been a lot of stories where people have been separated from or don't know or names were changed and identities lost and belonging was lost um, in the sense of, well, I don't really know who my you know great-grandfather was or my grandfather, I don't know anything about them or when there's been an adoption in the sense of like I don't have a sense of belonging um, that this is the the doorway of the grief it's it's um and yet um, when you look at the the palms of your hands these lines in your hands these are your great great grandmother's lines and this face that, that's your face this is your great great grandfather's eyes and face it's like to begin to it's like um, they're they're in there, and I don't know the stories, but they know me, and that's so the the other twist in this is like I might not know who my ancestors are, but in this context of thinking about it, they know who I am, and uh, and so in the ritual when we we do uh, in preparation for the ritual we do some ancestral line clearing and connecting. Um, and so there are some ritual ways of uh, connecting to the ancestors that one doesn't know um, and beginning to deepen into that, in which we do some of which before the actual ritual itself. Um, but to trust that um, there are different ways of knowing um, and uh, to give uh, I, I, to give, uh, um, well, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, um, authority or um, justification or, or belief in um, these different ways of knowing um, that one can feel deeply um, and yet may not, may not have ever been able to go on Ancestry.com and say, oh yeah, that's my great, 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 great grandfather, grandmother, I can say, there they are. That's them, and they were here. Um, and I can't, again, I can't tell you how many countless times people have done some of the ancestral journeying and line clearing work and connect with information, and then later they end up validating the very thing that they connected with um, in a different way of knowing. Um, and so in indigenous culture, the way they say that you know, this realm that they call the realm of the ancestors, it, 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 it is side by side with this, with this realm. And, um, and that we can touch it and it can touch us. And we don't think of it generally that way. Um, but the, um, again, I, I would imagine you have had experiences of, of deep connection with, with a loved one who has crossed over that cannot be explained uh, with simple coincidence or, or uh, degrees of, uh, you know, statistical re proportional reality or something. Um, 
and, and these things, uh, I mean, we all have had those experiences. Um, and it's like, oh yeah, remember that. Remember that time when this happened? And it's like, how, so where did that come from? Um, so what I would say is if uh, you, um, in opening your heart, put out a request or an invitation to connect and then pay attention and see and watch what happens. Um, watch what shows up. Um, it's really as easy as that. Um, again, I, so many stories swim through my head about things that like that are, that aren't really explainable <laughs> um, by consensus reality. Um, but in indigenous culture, again, this understanding that our ancestors are, are right here. They're, they're, they're with us, they're, they're around us. Um, and it's just opening ourselves to, to that uh, belief possibility that opens up these channels for love and connection, which is really about, um, is those, the, the channels of compassion and love and wisdom that flow from that realm, um, from certain ones in that realm. Um, and here I often say that uh, being dead doesn't make one an ancestor necessarily. No more than being alive makes somebody healthy, conscious, and well. <laughs> but remember, there's this whole residue or, or area between the, the living and the dead that's unwell. And then there's the wellness on both sides. So there are, um, sometimes when people come to me and share a story, it's like, oh, I had this vision or I connected with this this, this spirit and and... And I'm thinking, I'm listening, I'm thinking, I don't know if I would take them home with me. <laughs> you know, you want to be no more than you would walk into a bar and just invite everybody home with you. You might get some good people, but probably not everybody would be, you know, worth inviting home. Um, so when we begin to think about, um, you know, the loving ancestors, those that lived well and died well, those that we don't know, but they know us. Um, and just calling on this, again, these rituals of, of invocation toward that realm um, in, in uh, it's less important that you uh, wrestle with the belief, um, test the theory, you know? Um, I always tell people, beliefs are like tools. If they work, use them. If they don't work, get a new one. Because they're also like blades of grass. As many blades of grass as there exist there are that many different beliefs. Um, and so we want to, we want to use the beliefs that work for us to, to leave a, you know, to lead a, a full and compassionate and engaged inspired life. Um, and if our beliefs limit us, you know, that's something to examine. Um, but I would encourage you to, to, to reach out to the ones that you don't know that know you. And, and, um, and if you're able to come to this ritual, um, well, I'll tell you what, um, given the time, and I'll ask in a, in a minute, I'll, I'll offer you all a, uh, an ancestral line clearing ritual that you can do. Um, that we won't be doing this particular one at the, um, at, the, at the weekend, but this is one that I sometimes recommend to people in order to activate and open those channels of communication. Um, so thank you. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? And Emma, where are we with time? Okay, yes, yeah. so I was going to come in there and say, um, we're just after eight. So we've got, yeah, it's nearly about five past eight. So we've about 10 minutes left. And I suppose I have a question, which I think you answered before for us, but I am imagining um, that it would be quite good to actually go into, you called it kind of the mechanics or the choreography of the ritual, but I know that there's this part of me is like, okay, so the ritual, what does it mean? We're here for four days. What are we going to be doing? You know, there's a lot of talk about ritual, but like what exactly <laughs> might we be doing? So I was wondering so if you could outline me. that for you. Yeah, please. Um, Cause now I think Natalie asked a similar question. Will there be a chance to really do this expression of this deep work? Um, so we arrive, I think it's a Thursday night, settle in, do opening ceremony, sharing circle, pretty much kind of the, the initial gathering. Um, Friday is uh, death lodge work. Now I put that name out there um, 
it's often a, a phrase used in the context of initiation or rites of passage. And that when we think about initiation and rites of passage, um, you can think about it this way. I always say, think of two rivers that run side by side in opposite directions. And one river that we call our ordinary life, we say begins at birth and ends at death, generally speaking, in this one lifetime. And yet this other river that flows in the opposite direction, it begins with a death and ends with a birth. So that a, a death lodge is a time of healing and reconciliation and doing um, some, some laying the ground, gathering the stories. Some of the stories I've heard, you know, today, uh, the, the stories of uh, my, the, the grief that my ancestors have carried that I not carry or this tragedy that happened to my friend that I'm carrying for her, or this thing that happened to me, or what's happening to our planet. Uh, you know, it's, it's beginning to gather the stories that we all carry, to begin to create the field of awareness. What are these things we are carrying? Some, some that are our own, some that we carry for others, some that I'm born into carrying. Um, and in that day of Death Lodge work, um, there'll be some individual work that just spontaneously happens um, within the circle in which, uh, you know, just something comes up for somebody and we'll just spontaneously work with that piece of work because it's, it's alive and it's present in the circle. Um, and that continues to build the energy. When I say work with it, um, it's employing the, uh, the awareness of this large field of grief and also you know, a, a clinical background and, and body-centered psychotherapies and all of these other traditions and, and shamanism of, of, of uh, hearing a story and beginning to work with what's happening. Um, another way to think about ritual is if you, if you think about <clears throat> when you're not feeling well and you go to the, <clears throat> the pharmacy or the drugstore or your doctor, and they give you some medication or a prescription, uh, on the bottle it'll say active ingredients. And there'll always be a long word that I can never say, but that's what gives the, the medicine its potency. In ritual, the active ingredients are fire and water and earth and mineral and nature and wind. And so these are the active ingredients to ritual. So as stories are coming out in the death lodge, if one story has a certain potency that begins to capture the group, we will just spontaneously go into ritual. Um, and so we spend the day bringing in the stories and, and working with it in that form. That's day one. That's, and then we also spend some solo time on the land um, into day two. Uh, we begin to, uh, plus the teaching, some of the teachings I gave you today, I'll give at the beginning. Then we move into Death Lodge. The second morning, um, we begin to talk about preparations for the, for the ritual on Saturday night. And we talk about gathering up your grief bundle. And so we'll send people out on the land in a, in a solo fashion to begin to gather your stories, gather your grief bundle of natural objects something that's combustible that we, you know, you may weave together some vines or leaves or twigs or flowers, but you come back with your grief bundle. Um, and so we have some solo time on the land in the morning. And then in the afternoon after lunch, we begin preparing the ritual space. So the ritual space, if you imagine uh, an arena of say uh, 30, a 30 foot diameter, uh, uh, 30 feet across um, in a circle. And within that space, there's one area that we designate as the village. And in that area, we're going to build a fire and we're going to uh, delineate the village space, maybe with stones or natural objects. And we're going to have an arbor that goes up on this side and one that goes up on this side. <clears throat> and then within that village space, is where we, we gather for the ritual, um, where the fire is, and then we'll have, there's drummers, so we'll have three or four drummers, 
uh, because drumming and song are what holds the ritual. Um, and then outside the village space, when you walk out of this arbor, you walk to an ancestor shrine that we have built out of natural objects. And we'll bring uh, pictures and candles and items uh, that connect us with loved ones, connect us with our grief, our stories. Um, and we'll put those in the ancestor shrine. Um, and then moving around the circle, uh, after the ancestor shrine and continue imagining walking around the circle, you, then you come to the grief shrine. And the grief shrine is this, uh, it could be eight feet across and it kind of comes up out of the ground, could be like even eight feet tall and it kind of arches over like this, uh, like a half dome. And then the, across the front, that invisible plane from where it arches over to, to the ground, will like be a line of stones, we'll have a line of ash and inside that space, Generally, is a black cloth and candles, um, and that's the grief shrine. Um, and so the choreography, and this happens at night. So once it gets dark, we go to the, the ritual space. There's a story that I can't tell you now, but there's a story that introduces the grief ritual. It's a very brief story. You want to say brief could be 30 seconds long, but it gives you the context of, of the of the grief ritual. Um, so I share the story um, to begin to bring us in that space. We do an invocation to begin the, to begin the ritual and then the drumming starts. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. Yes. The drumming starts and then the song that I teach you begins to start. And the song is not a the song itself is, is not words. It's a, it's a tonal song uh, that always reminds me of water. And maybe that's why it's a grief ritual song. But then we start to sing this grief ritual song as a collective. So imagine there's drummers that we're all standing in this area of the village. There's a fire burning. And we're looking out of the village area through these uh, gateways to the ancestor shrine and this grief ritual. And as we sing, the grief begins, it's, it's like the keening women or the tear listeners. As we sing, it begins to stir those stories and loosen those stories and that energy. And, and so if um, I'm just, just looking out kind of in, in, on the camera here. So if I'm, if I'm singing and I feel this, this movement of energy, this grief start to rise up in me and Emma's standing beside me, I'll, I'll just touch Emma on the shoulder. And if, if you get touched on the shoulder, what that means is you're gonna walk somebody through the, the, the choreography of the, the ritual. Um, so you never go alone. So when you're, we're singing, as you feel moved, you just touch whoever. And when you're touched, like, oh, I'm gonna walk with them. So I walk with them out this gateway over here and we walk over to the ancestor shrine. And at the ancestor shrine, um, one of you will be standing as the gatekeeper for that shrine. And, Sorry to, uh, to, I just want to bring back uh, the time uh, because it would be a pity just to be cut off since you're, uh, while you're still uh, explaining. Well, it won't cut off by itself. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and if somebody has to go, we'll have the recording afterwards. Yeah. Um, but thanks for that reminder. I'll, I'll talk quicker. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so you're walking through, you're ushered to the ancestor shrine and there's a, a gate, uh, a shrine keeper that's stationed there. Um, and, and that's a time to express, to say, to speak, to express anything that comes up. Um, and then from there, you're ushered over to the grief ritual shrine. And that's where you drop your grief bundle and then you express whatever. And sometimes the doorways to grief can look like anger. You know, it's, I always say the, the ancestors don't care uh, what you say just communicates something. And so it's, if it begins with anger, that's a good place to start too. Or if it begins with grief um, or movement or whatever is happening and you release that at the grief shrine and then you're ushered back into the other gateway and into the village and you're welcomed back. Um, now nothing stops while this is happening. All the time you're going through, the drumming's going, the singing's going. Um, 
nobody it's not that it, nobody's listening to anything you say you're up there and we can't we just want you know we're singing and we're watching and our song is essentially sending people through and the um and what i described was one person going through but imagine that three people get capped at the same time and three people are now going through with their people that are walking with them. So at the ancestor shrine, you've got seven people now. And then at the grief shrine, you've got seven people again, and people are expressing and emoting, um, and, and the singing's going and the drumming's going, and then you're ushered back into the village and welcomed back in. And so this, this circular choreography uh, of people going through, um, and, and uh, not just one at a time necessarily. As I say, most of the time, once it gets going, you have three or four people at each shrine um, expressing um, and then coming back through. And there's no no talking, no discussing. I say this isn't therapy. Um, and when you get back into the village and welcome back in, you start singing again. And uh, this this choreography goes on for a while. Um, I have uh, I'm known for underestimating the amount of time, and I was oh you know, maybe three hours for the whole thing. Um, the last couple of times I said three hours, we went all night. And so the sun was coming up as we were ending. <laughs> um, I have, But I want you to know I have been able to do this without going all night too. Um, but you just go, there's, there's not like, okay, it's time to end, time to go to bed. Once you're in the ritual space, you are held by the ritual. And they, I've, countless times people will say, you know, there was a moment it felt like it shifted and it was not just me doing something. It's like we were all there together and it was just going and it went until it was done. Um, as, and then there's a way to end the ritual with the, drinking, the, the drumming and the singing, a way to bring closure to it. Um, and then once we close out the ritual space and we, we head off to bed, I'm gonna say, nobody come back down here to the ritual space, let it sit for the night. Um, and then we come back the next morning and we, um, there's certain protocols of how you attend to the ritual space to clean it up and put it back um, that I want to start going to now. Um, and then we process that and then we have closing ceremonies uh, and then we end uh, around noon on Sunday. Um, so that's a lot. A little bit of information that covers that amount of time from Thursday evening to Sunday at noon, um, but that's some of the choreography from from one day of death lodge uh, to the next day of gathering our grief bundles in solo time in nature to building the ritual space, which takes an afternoon, and then the ritual itself, which happens Saturday night, <laughs> and in closing ceremonies on Sunday, and and cleaning up the space. So question, anything before we, before we end? And I'm willing to hang out here for a, a little bit longer if people have questions. Just one quick one. I, I thought it was Friday. So uh, we're, we're flying in. What time on Thursday would you want? What is the actual date? So I've, I've done this in different time formats and I've got several that I'm doing this year. I think some are, I'm thinking it's, um, what are the dates, Emma, do you have in front of you? Uh, 7th until 10th of May. And I think... Uh, well, that would be the first day. Right? Yeah, it's arrival time from noon on, but we really start at night. Yeah, the arrival time on that, that Thursday evening would be late. At, we want people to arrive before dinner and with enough time to set up their, their camping kit. So usually I give a window, say from you know, two to five or whatever time period. So there's enough time to set up and then have. First thing we do is have a meal together. So any Are other? Any other questions? Yeah. yeah logistical yeah. questions or or. We are we just. I would like to thank everyone. Yeah, and thank you, Kedar. Thank you so much. Um, I think this has been a really good introduction. And I'm sure those who've signed up to get this um, as a recording will be listening to it tomorrow or the day after, whatever, will be really grateful. Um, yeah, 
thank you. That's what I would say. And um, thank you. Thank you to nice. everyone yeah. here. And, and thank you to all those that aren't here that will be listening later. Yeah. Uh, please uh, feel free to email Emma or Hio or myself if you have other questions. Um, and I hope to see you there. And really looking forward to seeing this, this beautiful land I keep hearing about in Portugal. <laughs> All right. Well, y'all go well and uh, be safe. And I look forward to seeing you all soon.